Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and Baldur's Gate. Today I'm talking legendaries, the many legendaries that you'll find in this game with their strong, unique effects, passives and abilities are found on these items. Having said that, you know, many of the purple, very rare item quality, these are considered equal or better than many of the legendaries in many cases. But today we're talking legendaries. What are they? How do you get them? What are the details? How do they stack up compared to one another? Today we're covering them all, so let's begin. As you can see, I've got all but one of them because one of them is a choice. There is a grand total of 13 weapons and 5 legendary armor pieces. We'll begin with the weapons though and we're going to work our way from Act 1 to 2 to 3 in the order of what you can get and when. So that brings us to our first legendary weapon. Yes, the Silver Sword of the Astral Plane can be gotten the first out of all of these weapon legendaries in Act 1. Through a cheesy but valid method. It's technically the first you can get because of it. Basically, you meet Voss at the northwest of the wilderness in the first region and use an invisible potion before the encounter. Sneak up behind him and use a disarming attack, which will cause him to drop the weapon. The moment that he drops it, you want to slam the turn-based mode button to pause time so that the weapon stays on the ground. And then he'll simply leave as normal via the conversation with without the sword, which is left on the floor for you to grab. Whoever you end up grabbing the sword with, you can actually just let them die and revive them using withers back in the camp for max efficiency. If you want to get it normally or you missed it in Act 1, you can get it in Act 3 by signing Raphael's contract and talking to Voss, or getting the hammer, the Orphic hammer, in the House of Hope and speaking to Voss later. This weapon is ideally used by a Gith Yankee. When wielded by a Gith, this weapon deals extra psychic damage and they gain an advantage on intelligence, wisdom and charisma saving throws resistance to psychic damage and cannot be charmed flat out. Just these passives alone make it very good weapon for a Githyanki. It also comes with Soulbreaker. It stuns an enemy for two turns, dealing good damage at that. Overall, I feel that this weapon is very good when used by a Githyanki, and if you have it as a sort of two-hand stat stick because you don't have a better option on a non-Githyanki, it's fine, but not ideal. Next up is a weapon you'll find in Act 1 as well, one we should all know, the Blood of Lethander. Probably one of the most commonly acquired legendaries in the game. You find it in the Mountain Pass region of Act 1. After completing the puzzle in the Cathedral above, or you just don't, and enter the chamber hidden in the Gith Kresh down below, and you'll take the mace either way, whatever results you go for. It's quite straightforward. As you can see, it's a very holy mace. Coming with the passive once per long rest when your hit points are reduced to zero, you simply gain health, preventing you from dying. And it's like an AoE heal when that triggers. Fiends and undead standing in that light will be blinded unless they save a throw. It comes with its own attack, Sunbeam, which is actually a level 6 spell, very strong, blinding creatures and dealing damage to those standing in the beam. As far as this weapon goes, it's very good since you get it very early, but I do think it scales and falls off. Due to the fact that a big part of why it's so strong is the Sunbeam, and this is something you can get at higher levels anyway. Is it a bad weapon? By no means, but is it the best weapon? Probably not. Next up, we have the two spears. In Act 2, you'll find Saloon's Spear of Night or Shah's Spear of Evening. The problem with these spears is that it is a choice. You can only get one of them, respectively tied to Shadowheart storyline. Will you go for the darker choice and get the Spear of Night or the happier choice and get the Spear of Evening? Basically, will you spare or kill the Night Song? For Saloon's Spear of Night, then, you get what is probably the weaker of the two. Gain advantage and wisdom on saving throws and perception checks, which is nice. Dark vision, which is nice. Moonbeam, which is kind of a weaker version of the spell we just looked at. And Moon Moat, illuminating the area with wisps. This is the problem with this weapon, is that it's just a fine spear. On the other hand, we have Shah's Spear of Evening. Suited to a specific playstyle, but obviously very strong for that. You gain advantage on saving throws when you're even slightly obscured. And that's the playstyle of this weapon. It deals extra damage to creatures that are obscured obscured, so you want to fight within darkness clouds and otherwise. Also, you get blind immunity, which is nuts, and Shah's darkness itself, creating a cloud that, hey, obscures and you will use to fight in. It also gets the edge of darkness attack, which creates a darkness cloud while you attack as another way to generate them. When you do this, you also get a bunch of armor pieces that provide new abilities to fight in these clouds and while obscured, so it's just really good synergy there. Between the two, though, it's clear that the Shah spear serves its purpose better, but is less universal. Now we have the Act 3 stuff, where most of the legendaries are found by far. The first and easiest conceptually is the Devotee Mace. Basically, as soon as you reach level 10 on any cleric, such as Shadowheart, you'll get this button once per playthrough ability, Divine Intervention. You have four choices and the fourth and last option is to arm thy servant, meaning generate this legendary weapon to just have forever. It is another one hand mace used in the main hand specifically for a lower damage and doesn't come with anything particularly crazy, but it does have its own class action.
action the healing incense aura healing your allies and yourself for one to four hit points at the start of every turn for 10 turns and you can use it on a bonus action rather than a main action and it's usable once per long rest so this is ultimately a very good healing stat stick great if you have a healer in your party that you just want to be a healer but if you're looking for something to generate some kind of consistent healing or you have a heal bot on your team this would be perfect for them next up we have nairulna here which is also an easy one to get in act three upon entry of act three we veer west to the circus and speak with the djinn pickpocket the item that he's using to cheat the game that he's running and with that you can now win the game he'll punish you for cheating which is funny and then send you to a prison head to the portal to escape and as you'll see there's a chest next to the portal with a legendary trident within you'll need to break the lock of that chest however but it's not that big of a deal as you can see this is an incredibly good weapon it has its standard damage and then comes with thunder damage also it returns to your hand when you throw it so it's great for throwing builds and when you throw it it deals an explosion of thunder damage it also gives you better movement speed and jump distance and provides complete immunity to fall damage that's amazing. It also generates a glowing aura, which you can turn off via the passive menu. And it has two attacks that come with it. First is probably the best, Sephir Flash, which allows you to rush forward AoEing multiple targets on you pass by and blasting enemies and bleeding them. This can be used once per short rest so easily every single fight. Also, it comes with Zephyr Break, which is basically a thunder gale which knocks people back or off balance. Due to the raw stats and the thunder damage of this, I think it's one of the better weapons in the game. And the fact that it provides immunity to fall damage is amazing, but it has undeniably one of the best weapon proficiencies out of every weapon you could get. Moving on, we have the pretty generic standard we all know about this one, Orphic Hammer. The Orphic Hammer is found as part of the story. To get it, you agree to Raphael's contract or don't and steal it from the House of Hope. We have a full guide on that difficult challenge if you're interested, which I'll be talking about later again. But either way, whatever way you get the hammer, it's fairly decent. You have spell resistance, so advantage against spells. It comes with a class action Unshackling Strike. It doesn't come with anything special in terms of weapon proficiencies. It's just a fine, solid hammer option. Because it has spell resistance, though, it could be well worth putting on anyone just for that. Up next, we have a magic focus weapon, the incredible legendary staff, this Marco Heshkir. This one's easy to get. Head to the lower city and go to Sorcery Sundries and take the blue portal on the left up top. Overcome the conversation that follows, find a way down the level to the battle balcony below. There's a button on the north side of the room that teleports you to the middle and that's where the staff is. You just have to reveal the invisible lever however you want and beat the arcana check to simply then take the staff. It's that easy. This is one of the best weapons in the game undeniably and especially for spellcasters of course. You get arcane enchantment so a plus one bonus to spell save DC, spell attack rolls which is really nice and it comes with arcane battery, an incredible passive that allows you to choose a next spell to be completely free. So it allows you to cast multiple level six spells spells mid-fight and that restores per long rest. Just that alone is incredible but it also comes with Koreska's favor. It gives you resistance to a specific type of element and provides you two element attacks of that element you pick once per short rest so you can use it every fight. As a magical staff then I believe thanks to arcane battery and its passive of arcane enchantment it's undeniably the best staff you could run on a true spellcaster build which is likely going to be in most parties in the game. Another early weapon you can get in act three is going to be the duelist prerogative. This very cool rapier is part of the Save Vanra quest in town. Briefly explained, you'll find Ethel the Hag again at the Blushing Mermaid Bar. Reveal her, expose her, chase her into the cellar, and defeat her to save the child. However, you'll need a potion called Hag's Bane tied to the quest line. That makes her spit out the kid, so once you do that, you're free to defeat her. After you save the child, though, you can get the weapon from her mother as thank you. It's a rapier that deals piercing and necrotic damage, and it wants you to use it with just one hand and no offhand. While your offhand is empty, you score a critical hit on a 19 roll rather than a 20 which is nice but more importantly it just gives you an extra reaction per turn withering cut on hit with a melee weapon allows you to use a reaction to deal an additional necrotic damage equal to your proficiency bonus so because you get two reactions you can regularly just do a withering cut you can challenge to a duel forcing them to focus on you and it will bleed them for a bonus action for three turns whereas jeweler's enthusiasm means when not dual wielding you get to use a bonus action to attack again 
really nice. This is undeniably a fantastic one-handed weapon for any build that wants to focus on that, of which there's going to be quite a few. Next up is going to be the Balderon's Giant Slayer, this huge great sword, which is a reward at the end of the Worm Way. Have a whole guide on this one, how to get to it and beat all the challenges within on the channel right now. As a weapon, it is very good. Its passive Giant Slayer causes on hit double the damage from your strength modifier. And the weapon grants advantage on attack rolls against large enemies. It comes with two amazing abilities. First, Giant Form, which causes you to grow, increasing the damage you deal and giving you 27 temporary hit points. And advantage on strength checks and saving throws for 10 turns per short rest, meaning every single fight you should be running that. Also, it's unique, top all the big folk attack comes in, deal extra damage based on your proficiency bonus, and even more damage to those giant enemies. If you're looking for a great sword, it's probably the best one you can find. Next up is the legendary bow, Gontir Mail. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is a reward you can technically miss by accidentally avoiding the boss fight encounter in Vol. To get it, you just need to go to the west side of the lower city in the Steel Watch Foundry, work your way in, and go all the way to its end in the final room where you walk into the middle intentionally, which triggers the Titan boss fight. By defeating it, you can loot it and get the bow. Promise victory. On hit, possibly inflict Guiding Bolt upon the target, which causes the next attack roll made against this creature to have advantage. A very nice debuff. It also glows, generating that light aura. It comes with its own celestial haste. So yes, for five turns rather than 10, you can use this ability to give yourself or an ally haste. That's amazing for a non-spellcaster. It comes with its own weapon proficiency, Bolt of Celestial Light, which causes Frighten. Also after attacking, ranged weapon attacks made by this weapon will deal an additional bit of radiant damage. If it misses, it won't use superiority die to use this attack, and it's usable every short rest, so every fight very, very strong. This bow is great. Its only issue is that it's not a hand crossbow because those are amazing in this game. Last up for the weapons then is the duo of Crimson Mischief and Bloodthirst, which come in Act 3 from the same place. They are the reward for defeating and looting Orin, which you'll do as part of the main story. So without spoilers, you need to enter the Temple of Baal found in the Undercity and work your way to Orin and all the quests that is involved with this and kill her. She just drops both of them. So first with the Crimson Mischief then. It comes with Prey Upon the Weak. This weapon deals additional piercing damage against targets with 50% of their hit points or less. If used in the main hand when you make an attack with advantage, the target takes extra piercing damage. Whereas if you use it with the offhand, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. So either way, it's doing bonus damage, whichever, you know, main or offhand you have. But because it's a weapon enchantment plus two, the idea here is that it's meant to be used in duo with the other weapon, which is, of course, the iconic Bloodthirst. This has improved critical. The number you need to roll a crit while attacking is reduced by one, and the effect can actually stack, which is insane. It comes with the cantrip True Strike, gaining advantage on your next attack roll for two turns. And you can use that as a bonus action every short rest, so every fight. If it's used in the main hand, you get exploit weakness. Creatures hit by this weapon receive vulnerability to piercing damage, meaning double damage of all piercing damage sources. That's insane. Probably why you want to use this in the main hand. However, if you use it in the offhand, when a creature misses you with a melee attack, you can retaliate and gain true strike. Still, I think this is better used in the main hand. So which is the best legendary weapon? It's kind of hard and unfair to say. You can't really compare them. They all serve different purposes. However, I can pick my top three for what whatever purpose they serve. Firstly, of course, we have the legendary staff. This one with its arcane enchantment and arcane battery is ridiculous and easily the best spell casting staff that exists in the game. So if you have any true spell casters that would use a staff, they should be running this and that is obvious and that's why it's my number one pick in that category. On the other hand, what about a two-hand weapon? I actually think Nyrulna is going to be the best pick there. Outside of its bonus of thunder damage and all that being very nice, I just think that the fact that it gives immunity to fall damage and extra move speed and jump distance means you can always reach targets and have a smoother experience moving through the world. Also, because it has its ridiculous weapon proficiency, Zephyr Flash, which deals great damage, is a great gap closer, is AoE, and allows you to reach targets you otherwise just couldn't, I think it's pretty much the best or one of the best weapon proficiencies you will find. The last category is difficult. It's kind of like a one hand, more dex focus pick. Obviously, a lot of people are going to think the Blood of Lathander is going to be the best pick, but again, I think it falls off in terms of scaling because you can get Get Sunbeam through other methods, though it is nice the way it saves lives. But in terms of the other weapon picks, I might think about, say, Bloodthirst, but because it's meant to be used in duo, I think that's going to be quite niche and not a lot of people are going to run that. I think more people are going to run the Duelist Prerogative, so I will put that as my third pick based purely on that. Again, it's kind of like splitting hairs. 
So with all 13 weapons accounted for though and talked about, what about the armors? Of which there's only five. Only one comes in Act 1, which is immediate from just opening and playing the game. The Mask of the Shapeshifter. This is a reward for just buying the digital deluxe edition version and you just find it in your camp chest. By having it on, you'll get access to Shapeshift, which is basically another form of disguised self, though a bit more reliable. This can be useful because you can turn yourself into like a small gnome and fit into smaller places or into like a race that speaks to one of its own race and get perks from that, like a Gith Yankee. It is useful, but obviously there are no stats. It's pretty tame, probably the worst armor piece overall. Moving on to Act 3, though, we'll start with the easiest to get, which is this legendary shield, Viconia's Walking Fortress. This is a drop from Viconia herself, the mother superior of the Sharon cult. You find her in the House of Grief, which is found northwest in the lower city. Simply go interact with her and ultimately defeat her in the big combat encounter involved, and she'll just drop it. As a shield, it is fantastic, plus three to your armor class, and it comes with the Buke of Mighty. When a foe hits you with a melee attack, you can use a reaction to deal force damage to it, also knocking it prone unless they succeed the saving throw, which leaves them vulnerable. It comes with Spell Guard, so you get advantage on saving throws against spells. They just have a disadvantage against you, so counter spell very good. It comes with two abilities, Reflective Shell, which is amazing. Once per short rest as bonus action, you get a two-turn buff of a protective shell that envelops you, reflecting projectiles targeted is at you back to their point of origin. Then there's Warding Bond, which is just a spell we can get generally, but is another way to get it. Thanks to its passives and reflective shell though, I think this is easily the best shield in the game. Next up, we have one of the best helm pieces in the game, the Helm of Balderon. This comes from the same place as the Balderon Greatsword, as mentioned before, the final challenge of the Worm Way. Again, we have a full guide on how to do all of that to get this item on the channel if you want to know. But in terms of a piece of equipment, it's insanely good. As a medium armor, not everyone can wear it, but those that can will benefit from a heal every turn for two hit points. You also have plus one to AC and saving throws, and you cannot be stunned at all or be crit. So, absolutely incredible. Put it on and never think about it again, just passives that are very strong. Finally, the last two legendaries come from the same place, which is the House of Hope, Raphael's Domain. To get the gloves, you'll need to specifically save Hope, who is part of that and has her own quest line. It's the reward for saving her. While the other legendary armor involved is the Hell Dusk armor, which comes from defeating and looting Raphael himself. For these two though, we do have a full guide on the quest, on the House of Hope, that you can check on the channel now. For the gloves of soul catching though, these are pretty much the best monk gloves you will find in the game. Additional force damage on your unarmed attacks, and once per turn on an unarmed hit, you can gain 10 hit points, right, which is insane, or you can get advantage on attack rolls and saving throws. It's up to you to choose. It also gives plus two to constitution, which is just really nice. So yeah, undeniably the best monk gloves. And lastly, we have the Hell Dusk armor here. 21 AC armor, heavy armor, but anyone can wear it because it provides the heavy armor proficiency just for putting it on. Infernal Retribution means when you succeed a saving throw, the caster just gets burning for three turns, so fire damage. And it comes with Prime Aegis of Fire. You have resistance to fire damage and cannot be burned, as well as three less damage from all sources. And it even gives you fly as a spell ridiculous. Which is the best legendary armor piece then? I think it's easily the Hell Dusk armor. Just because it's a universal thing, anyone can wear it no matter what build or playstyle, which is simply strong as hell. But its passives are obviously really good, preventing you from being burned, reducing damage, providing flight, it's just awesome. And because again, anyone can use it, I think it stands obviously above the rest, based purely on that. But there you have it, all 18 legendaries in game currently covered and discussed. It's been pretty hard to judge them compared to one another since obviously they serve different builds and purposes, but I hope this comparison was useful to you. All of them are very cool and I do think for like the launch of the game and these are our legendaries, it is a good collection. But yeah, I hope this was interesting and useful to you. For now, I've been Hollow, you've been you, thank you for watching, we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world our stage Is, uh, goodbye